Rita Curran could not have been happier with her decision to become an elementary school teacher. She taught second grade at Milton Elementary School. Throughout her career, Rita made a lasting impression on her students, earning a reputation for being a dedicated and compassionate educator. When former students saw Rita in the hallways, they would run up to hug her. Rita was genuinely happy to see them, always greeting them with a warm smile. Her former students cherished these moments as they remembered her positive impact on their lives. The case surrounding her murder would remain unsolved for 52 years. Rita Curran was born to Mary and Thomas Curran in Brooklyn, New York. She was one of three children. During Rita's childhood, Mary and Thomas decided to move their family to Burlington, Vermont. In 1969, Rita graduated from Mount St. Mary Academy, a prestigious institution located in Burlington. Rita then pursued her education at Trinity College. She studied education and obtained a degree in the subject. Although Rita was well-liked by everyone who knew her, she was naturally introverted. It took her a while to open up to others and feel comfortable in social settings. Despite this initial shyness, Rita was determined to overcome her reservations and be more social and open to new experiences. To accomplish her goal, Rita joined various organizations within Burlington. She became a member of the Champlain Echoes Barbershop Singing Group, the Alumni Association of Trinity College, the Confraternity of Christian Doctrine, and the Milton's Women's Club. Faith played a pivotal role in Rita's life, as she was a practicing Catholic. The Curran family attended St. Anne's Catholic Church. Rita dedicated her time and energy to teaching religion classes to children after services on the weekends. When she was 24, Rita made a significant decision by moving out of her parents' house for the first time. After careful consideration, she found the perfect ground floor apartment on a quiet residential street in Burlington. This location offered a peaceful atmosphere, surrounded by families and students attending the University of Vermont's Burlington campus. Burlington was a safe area in Vermont with very little violent crime. This level of security created a welcoming environment where people felt secure, leaving their doors and windows unlocked and curtains open. Residents of Burlington never thought anything bad could happen in their peaceful city. Rita found two roommates to move into her apartment in Burlington with her. Beverly, a 24-year-old woman, and Carrie, a 19-year-old. In June 1971, the three young women settled into their new home on Brooks Avenue. Since Rita was on summer break from Milton Elementary School, to earn extra income, she started working as a housekeeper at the Colonial Motor Inn. During this time, she also attended courses at the University of Vermont in reading and language arts. Rita did not know Beverly and Carrie prior to moving in with them. Even though they lived together and were all about the same age, they were not close. Rita had a different group of friends she hung around with and spent little time in the apartment. Rita had been living in the apartment for several weeks in July 1971 when she contacted her mother to discuss her dissatisfaction with her roommates and their treatment of her. According to Rita, she woke up one morning to find a young man sleeping on their couch. This situation made her uncomfortable, and she wanted to discuss the matter with her roommates. When Rita approached Beverly and Carrie about her concerns, a fight ensued. The three girls engaged in a heated argument, which led to further tension in the apartment. Rita expressed her desire to move out of the apartment and return home to live with her parents. When Rita told her mother about her troubles, she mentioned that she planned to leave soon. On Monday, July 19th, Rita returned home around 10.20 p.m. after attending her barbershop singing group practice. Upon her arrival, Rita discovered that her roommate Beverly was preparing to go out for the night. Beverly was meeting with their other roommate, Carrie and friend Paul, for dinner and drinks at a nearby restaurant. Still tired from her evening activities, Rita decided to get ready for bed. She began by placing curlers in her hair as she thought about her plans for the upcoming weekend. This weekend held a special significance for Rita as she was eagerly anticipating attending the Milton Women's Club picnic at the Branch Cottage with her mother. Meanwhile, Beverly continued her preparations to go out for the night. Beverly decided to take the only key to the apartment with her, leaving the door unlocked in case Carrie arrived home before her. As the night progressed, Beverly, Carrie, and Paul made their way back to the apartment on Brooks Avenue. They arrived at approximately midnight and entered the apartment. 
Beverly Carey and Paul stayed up to talk, assuming Rita had gone to sleep. Around 1 a.m., Beverly opened Rita's bedroom door to check on her and found Rita lying nude on the floor, covered in blood, her curlers askew. Beverly immediately shouted for help, and as Carey placed the call to 911, Paul attempted to perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on Rita. However, their efforts proved to be in vain, as the medics pronounced her deceased when they arrived at the scene. As the investigators began to process the apartment, they noticed that everything seemed to be in place, nothing was missing, and there was no sign of a struggle in the living room area. Investigators also discovered a lark cigarette butt next to Rita's body. At the time, in 1971, DNA testing was still only in the realm of science fiction books. Therefore, there wasn't much that could be done with it. However, the investigators at the scene had the foresight to preserve the cigarette butt, hoping that advancements in technology would eventually enable them to utilize this piece of evidence to solve the case. Unfortunately, despite the extensive search of the apartment, no usable fingerprints were found that could be compared to a future suspect. Investigators discovered that Rita did have blinds on the windows of her ground floor apartment, but they were sheer. As a result, the inside of the apartment was visible to anyone, including predators, who peered in. The detectives wondered if Rita's murderer had been lurking outside her apartment before murdering her. Because Beverly had left the apartment door unlocked, the detectives assumed the suspect entered the apartment this way. In the back of the apartment, investigators discovered bloodstains on a door leading outside from the kitchen, which led them to conclude that the killer had exited the apartment through this door. After the medical examiner conducted an autopsy on Rita's body, it was discovered that she had been strangled manually and severely beaten, likely due to the use of large fists. Additionally, the medical examiner found evidence that Rita had been sexually assaulted. When Rita's family was contacted by the police and informed that she had been murdered, they were stunned and unable to think of anyone who would want to harm her. Tom, Rita's brother, later stated that at the time of Rita's murder in 1971, there were no social workers or victim advocate groups available to assist his family. As devout Catholics, they relied on the church and their rosary beads as their only means of support. Detectives questioned Beverly and Carrie, Rita's roommates, but they did not know anything about Rita's life other than that she was a second-grade teacher. After Rita's murder, Beverly and Carrie moved out of the apartment they shared with her, fearing that the murderer would come back to finish the job. The detectives then proceeded to interview Rita's neighbors, but unfortunately, no one had heard anything the night she was murdered. Despite the clear signs that Rita put up a fight for her life during the attack, there was no evidence that anyone had heard her shouting for help or screaming. Residents of Burlington had become accustomed to leaving their doors open at night. However, after Rita's murder, there was a noticeable shift in behavior. People started to take extra measures to secure their homes, purchasing additional locks for their doors and windows. Nothing like this had ever happened in Burlington, and everyone was afraid. Local and state authorities quickly sprang into action, dedicating significant resources to the investigation. Detectives who had planned to take vacation time found themselves with their trips canceled, as the case demanded all hands on deck. With a plea to the public for assistance, the Burlington Police Department was flooded with tips. Unfortunately, many of these tips were false, or the result of people seeking to settle personal grudges. Despite the initial skepticism and bizarre leads, the detectives consistently pursued every tip. They refused to overlook any potential clue, no matter how strange it might seem. However, none of the tips ever resulted in the identification of Rita's murderer. The search for justice continued as the community eagerly awaited a resolution. After Rita's murder, the detectives began looking into sex offenders living in the Burlington area as potential suspects. Their investigation led them to discover a disturbing incident that occurred only a few days before Rita's death. On July 11th, a woman was awoken in the middle of the night by a man sexually assaulting her. She immediately tried to scream for help, but the man threatened to kill her if she made any noise. Terrified for her life, she complied with the assailant's demands out of fear. In addition to the July 11th attack, the detectives learned that several women in the Burlington area had called the police to report instances of peeping toms and prowlers in the area. These reports provided additional cause for concern and led the detectives to believe that there might be a connection between the string of assaults and Rita's murder. 
Another report that stood out to the detectives working on Rita's murder case was an incident that occurred several weeks before Rita's death. Several young women who lived together reported hearing a noise at the rear of their house. Initially, the women did not contact the police, considering the noise to be a minor occurrence. However, after going to bed, they once again heard the sound. One of the women headed downstairs to check the door and ensure it was locked and chained. As she approached the door, she opened it slightly to peer outside, suspecting that an animal may have caused the noise. However, as she opened the door, the woman made eye contact with a man who fled. Nearly 100 people who knew Rita, including her neighbors and co-workers, were interviewed by detectives. The detectives conducted an extensive investigation, aiming to gather as much information as possible about Rita and the circumstances leading to her death. In addition to the interviews, the detectives arranged for several people to take polygraph examinations. On July 23, St. Anne's Roman Catholic Church was packed with nearly 400 people who came to mourn Rita. Several plain-clothed police officers were discreetly positioned throughout the church. The officers blended in with the mourners, carefully observing and listening attentively to conversations or interactions. Their objective was to obtain valuable information that could lead them to Rita's murderer. In the weeks following Rita's murder, a 24-year-old man named Charles Manning from Rhode Island was arrested in Massachusetts on a burglary charge. While in custody, Charles allegedly confessed to murdering 19 women. This revelation caught the attention of detectives working on Rita's case, who were left wondering whether Charles Manning could be a suspect in her murder. However, after investigating, the detectives determined that Charles Manning was not involved in the crime and ruled him out as a suspect. As the investigation into Rita's murder continued throughout the summer of 1971, another person became a focus for the detectives. Bruce Alicandri, a 28-year-old man, was arrested after he was captured for attempting to sexually assault a woman. For a moment, the detectives considered Bruce Alicandri as a suspect in Rita's murder but upon further examination, they determined that he had nothing to do with the case. One of the detectives from Burlington traveled to Quantico, Virginia, the FBI headquarters, hoping to collaborate with the agency to narrow the search for a suspect. The detective brought evidence from Rita's crime scene, hoping the FBI crime lab could analyze it and provide valuable insights. However, examining the evidence would take months, and the FBI crime lab would need time to go over it. Eight months after Rita's murder, the detectives on the case remained dedicated to finding justice for her. The secret witness organization put out a $3,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest of a suspect in Rita's murder case. As the months turned into years, detectives pursued several viable suspects, but unfortunately, they could not definitively link any of them to Rita's murder. Mary and Thomas Curran, Rita's parents, became frustrated waiting for answers. The passage of time only intensified their pain and fueled their belief that there was a cover-up happening. They believed that more could have been done to search for Rita's killer, but politics were involved. After The Stranger Beside Me by Anne Rule was published in 1980, detailing the author's experience working with Ted Bundy at a crisis center. Suspicion grew regarding Bundy's potential involvement in the murder of Rita Curran. In the book, Rule revealed that Detective Robert Keppel had questioned Bundy, who confessed to murdering a young woman in Burlington, Vermont, in 1971. Bundy's statements, in which he claimed he killed the victim while visiting Vermont to obtain information about his birth, led Detective Keppel to believe that Bundy was referring to Rita Curran. Anne Rule also drew attention to a blurred notation from a Burlington dog catcher's report, which mentioned a person named Bundy being bitten by a dog the same week that Rita Curran was killed. This connection further strengthened suspicions that Bundy may have been involved in Rita's murder since she lived in Burlington. On January 22, 1989, just hours before Bundy's execution, he made a chilling confession to FBI Special Agent William Hagmeyer. Bundy admitted to his involvement in several additional murders, but denied having any involvement in Rita Curran's case. Several more years went by, and Rita Curran's case remained at a standstill. However, in 2014, due to advancements in DNA technology, cold case detectives decided to send evidence from Rita's crime scene to a forensic lab in New York City, including the Lark cigarette butt that investigators had discovered near her body in 1971. 
The testing at the New York City lab was conducted thoroughly, and the detectives in Burlington received a full male DNA profile of their suspect in Rita's murder. However, when they placed the sample in the CODIS database, they were unable to find any matches. CODIS stands for Combined DNA Index Systems. It is a database law enforcement agencies use to store and compare DNA profiles in the United States. In 2016, detectives began focusing their efforts on investigating Rita's murder full-time. Ted Bundy was once again considered a suspect when the case was reopened. However, DNA testing ruled out Bundy's involvement. As time went on, Rita Curran's murder became known as Burlington's oldest cold case. The passage of nearly 50 years since Rita's murder presented challenges for the cold case detectives as they attempted to revive the investigation. One of the key obstacles they faced was that several key witnesses were deceased. Many had passed away over the years, leaving behind a fragmented and incomplete body of evidence. Despite these challenges, detectives remained determined to bring justice to Rita's family. In 2022, they decided to send her blood-stained clothing to a forensic lab in Florida, where new DNA extraction techniques would be employed to obtain additional DNA evidence from their suspect. While waiting for the results from the DNA extraction, detectives decided to take a different approach. They sent the genetic evidence from the Lark cigarette butt to a genealogy company, Parabon, which had access to larger databases using forensic genetic genealogy. C.C. Moore, a scientist and genealogy expert who worked at Parabon Labs, linked the DNA evidence found at the scene from the Lark cigarette butt to a relative of the suspect. This breakthrough provided crucial information that allowed Cece Moore to proceed with her investigation. Armed with the name of the suspect's relative, Cece Moore embarked on a comprehensive investigation. Through careful examination, she discovered the name of an individual who seemed like a viable suspect in Rita's murder. Cece gave the name of the suspect to the detectives working on Rita's case, who verified that the person was, in fact, Rita's murderer. Finally, Rita's case was solved. Detectives with the Burlington Police Department held a press conference in February 2023 to announce the name of Rita's murderer, solving the oldest cold case in the city. Rita's murderer's name was William DeRuz. The Florida Forensic Lab extracted DNA from Rita's bloody nightgown, which, after testing, solidified William DeRuz as the person who took Rita's life. However, it seemed as if justice was served too late because William DeRuz died from a drug overdose in a San Francisco motel in 1986. For Rita's parents, who passed away in 1991 and 2002, the news of William's identification came too late. After William DeRuz was identified as a suspect in Rita's murder using forensic genetic genealogy, a detective wanted to question his ex-wife, who was married to William at the time of Rita's murder. According to William's wife, she and William married only two weeks before Rita was killed. On the night of Rita's murder, July 19th, she and William got into a fight, and he left their apartment to cool off. During the interview in 2022, William's ex-wife disclosed to detectives that William had a history of sudden outbursts of violence. It is plausible to assume that William, fueled by his anger towards his new wife, sought revenge on her by targeting an innocent woman. Unable to harm his wife directly, he saw Rita as she was preparing for bed, inserting curlers into her hair through the large apartment windows. This sight likely enraged him, and he seized the opportunity to lash out against a woman. Rita's story is one of immense sadness. Her life was cut short, and her murderer escaped justice. The pain and injustice she suffered continue to haunt her family, even after so many years, it is a reminder of the fragile nature of life and the power of hatred and rage. Despite the sadness, Rita's story also serves as a reminder of the importance of seeking justice and closure. Her family's tireless efforts to uncover the truth and bring to justice her murderer is a testament to their unwavering commitment to justice. Their story serves as a reminder that no crime should go unpunished and that the pursuit of justice should be a priority no matter how old the case. We invite you to dive deeper into this discussion, share your insights or learn more about the nuances of this case. Whether you're intrigued by the psychological aspects, interested in the societal implications, or have theories of your own, we want to hear from you. For more stories like this, click the link above to learn about the horrific murder of a mother taken at the hands of her husband in when one woman isn't enough. Thanks for watching. 
Stay curious, stay connected. Stay with Really Unreal.